Okay, good morning and welcome back to our second lecture on BC308. Thank you all uh, once again for connecting. We are going through the book of Revelation. We just completed chapter 3 and there are some questions on the chat. So we're going to look at the questions on the chat. This question um, from John says, uh, there's an interpretation of the seven churches with respect to periods. Yeah, you know, 30 to 380, 100 to 1380, 1314 to 590, and so on. Is it the right way of interpretation? Should we subscribe to this? Right. So our response to this is no. We do not subscribe to it for the for these reasons. One, um, when the Lord Jesus is giving the message to John, he says, write things that are, things that are, right? And the things which are yet to come. That's, I think, in Revelation 1 uh, and verse 19. Right, the things which you have seen are the things which are and the things which will take place after this. The things which will take place after this starts off in chapter 4, verse 1, where he says, come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. So Revelation 1, 19, things which will take place. Revelation 4, 1, things which will take place, which means chapters 2 and 3 have to do with things which are. So there is no indication, and very, it's very clear from the message Jesus gives, that it is for the seven churches that existed. There is no indication anywhere in Scripture that those seven churches represent, or they are a type, or a, they represent seven church ages. There is no indication of that. The best we can do is to learn from those seven churches. These seven churches literally existed at that time. Uh, we have some understanding of their context, but for us, most important is the lessons we take from those churches. Uh, there are there are obviously a lot of teaching and books and others like you know that use these seven churches, seven church periods, but. Uh, I think it's wrong to do that because it was not the original intent of what Jesus spoke, right? And so we, we do not subscribe to it. Next question is from Devia, and um, this is based on Revelation chapter 3, verse 4 and 6, uh, 4 to 6, where the Lord uh, talks about. Uh, that those who are victorious, he will not blot that the name of that person or the book of life, uh, but will acknowledge the name the before the Father and the angels. The question is, does it mean uh, here? What does blot the name from the book of life imply? Does it mean everyone's name is written in the book of life? And when one does not believe that names get blotted out, or is it a warning? for the saved ones. So then does it mean that once a person is saved, there's a possibility of losing salvation? That is, even if a person is a believer, there could be a possibility of losing salvation. Right? So the Book of Life is is interesting. So we, we try to kind of, you know, the, the, there are some references in the Old Testament uh, about Moses. He says, you know, he tells God, Lord, you take my, if you don't f forgive Israel, you blot my name out. You know, take my name off on the book of life. Malachi, God says, you know, there's a book of remembrance. God's recording everything is being written. Uh, that's different from the book of life, but just mention that. Then in the New Testament, Revelation 13 says, the book of life, which was written before the foundation of the world. And then we see it here in Revelation 3, that the Lord says, uh, to wh whoever overcomes, I will not blot out his name from the book of life. Revelation 20, it's the book of life that's opened. And whose who name was not found written in the book of life? The names were not there. 
they cast into the lake of fire. So how do we understand this, this whole dynamic? I mean, we only have few references about the Book of Life. So uh, given these few references, what, care, what conclusions can we come to? First, we know the Bible says the Book of Life was written before the foundation of the world. That means even before God created a human creation, created people, names were written. Okay. And then he is saying it's possible that names will be blotted out. Moses saying, take my name out. And uh, here he's saying, you know, uh, the one who overcomes, his name will remain there in the book of life. So how do we understand this? Now, again, I, I'm speaking with the limited references we have. Um, it seems like, I'm saying it seems like, because we're just putting all these references together. It seems like, and this goes also into, you know, this whole understanding of the predestination of the foreknowledge of God which is which we read about Romans chapter 8 Ephesians chapter 1 uh, and and, uh, and other other places like Romans 9 to 11 where basically whom God foreknew he predestined that they will be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ so God foreknew so my understanding based on these these scriptures is the book of life was written. God foreknew the people who would say yes to him. And they, their names have been put in the book of life. But it's all conditional. Conditional meaning we all have free will. God put our names there, and we must live this out, right? Uh, so th that's where the, there is the possibility of somebody losing their salvation. Now, can a believer lose their salvation? Uh, again, we had to take a lot of scriptures, put it together, and I'm just making the statement. I'm not necessarily, you know, going through all the scriptures, but uh, perhaps Hebrews chapter six, Hebrews chapter ten. Uh, those passages see, clearly indicate to us that it's possible for somebody to taste of the good things of the kingdom of God, to taste of the word of God, to taste of the Holy Spirit, and then to trample underfoot the very blood of Jesus and to come into a place where there is no repentance for them. Now, Hebrews 10.38 says, If any man draws back, my soul will have no pleasure in him. So these and other scriptures seem to tell us that yes it is possible that somebody could lose their salvation understanding about the book of life that god foreknew he put their names in the book of life there is a possibility that somebody would be blotted out but what does that depend on it depends on our free choice we have to endure to the end they have to follow jesus to the end it's possible that somebody believes in jesus christ they're genuinely saved but they withdraw from their faith uh, First John 5 also talks about this. If a brother sins a sin unto death, uh, uh, if a, bro a brother sinning, you pray for him, but if he's a sin unto death, they don't even pray for him. Yeah, so there is this possibility. Okay, that's that's in a nutshell, but you know, both these things are big questions uh, that we can look at scriptures and uh, discuss. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so let's pick up the chapter four. So, chapters two and three are about things that are, meaning things that were actually happening during John's time. Chapter four transitions into things that will come to pass. If you read uh, Revelation chapter four, let's please read verses one through five. Somebody could read that. Revelation four, one through five, please. After these things, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately 
I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne set, sat set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightning, thundering, and voices. And these were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are in the seven spirits of God. Amen. Amen. All right. So, Revelation 4.1. There's a door open, and John, John is having this vision. There's a door open, and he's invited, come up. I'm going to show you things which must take place. So the door opening is almost like I'm transitioning out of this realm into the other realm. So he's, the, his spirit is entering in to another realm, entering into the spiritual realm. So you can imagine his body is on the island of Patmos, but God is taking his spirit into the next, the other realm, the spiritual realm, door opening, transition, one to the next is going in. The so spirit is taking in, in there to the spiritual realm. And the Lord Jesus says, I'm going to show you things which must take place after this. So Revelation 4 is out in the future, things that are yet to come, things that are going to take place. So now we're getting into the real, the revelation of things to come. And so John finds himself in the spirit. He's now in the spiritual realm and he's beginning to see and experience things in the spiritual realm, right? So his spirit man, so to speak, his spirit man is in the spiritual realm. His body is here, but his spirit man is translated. He's in the spiritual realm and he's hearing, seeing, experiencing thing, things in the spiritual realm and remember like we said in the beginning he is using language and knowledge that he has from his day and time to capture the things he is seeing so he is using you know when he says jasper and sardis and rainbow uh, emerald he is using these stones to describe the colors that he sees so look, I'm seeing all these colors. Uh, this That means the spiritual realm is very vibrant. There is color. The spiritual realm is not like, oh, it's there's nothing here. <laughs> there is, uh, a, you know, I, I can't see anything here. Oh, it's all just space. No. The spiritual realm is so real. You know, and, 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 and he's saying like, all the, I'm seeing all these colors, the green and and uh, uh, red and i'm seeing multicolors like rainbow i'm seeing the throne i'm seeing somebody sitting on the throne right now he's not telling us okay the one who had a throne had a long beard and you know i don't know he's just seeing this that this this magnificent presence of god on the throne and all of these colors, it's so real in the spiritual realm. And what's interesting is, so this is a throne room. He's seeing the throne room, and he's seeing around this throne, there are 24 thrones, so maybe 12 on either side. And he's seeing 24 elders. They're all clothed in white robes. They have the crowns. And there is this, this whole light, you know, so he's talking about light and sound. A lightning, thundering voices, there's light and sound, there's something very, very powerful happening. Now, I mean, we'll talk about the seven lamps and seven spirits, uh, but the picture here is 24 elders. They have their robes, they have their crowns. This leads us, and I'm not saying this is conclusive, but this leads us to understand 
First of all, 24 elders. Who are they? What we can say, what can we say about these elders? Who are these people seated? You know, they've got this privileged position to be seated on either side of the throne. Twelve on either side, twenty-four elders. They're seated. What we know uh, uh, from Revelation twenty-one is that at least one of these elders is speaking, and uh, uh, actually, let me see. Uh, uh, so Revelation, I think, sorry, Revelation 19, the elder says to him, uh, give this verse, Revelation 19, verse 10, uh, Revelation 19, 10, just a cross reference here. I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And Revelation 22, verse 8. Uh, Revelation 22, 8 and 9. Now I, I, John, saw and heard these things. When I heard, I saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel. That's the messenger who showed me these things. And he said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book, worship God. So, Revelation 19.10, he's saying, I am your fellow servant and of your brethren. Revelation 22.8-9, I'm your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets. <laughs> so, this seems to give us some idea of who these elders would be. Because one of these elders is talking to John throughout the book of Revelation. John falls down to worship him. Was The elder is talking to him, giving him the message. And he says, look, I'm your brethren, Jewish. I'm of the prophets. So it could be one of the Old Testament prophets. Um, and I'm your fellow servant. I'm your co-worker. I'm also serving God. So, and I'm not saying this is conclusive, but we could think that the 12 on one side are the 12 apostles of Jesus Christ uh, in the, from the New Testament. The other 12 could be 12 of the Old Testament prophets. We don't know their names, but whomever, whomever God has chosen based on these two passages, Revelation 19.10, Revelation 22. Uh, 9 and 10, or 8 and 9. Because he says, I am your fellow servant. I am your brethren. I am of the prophets. So based on that, we are saying it's possible. Now, we, we know that uh, the 12 apostles of Jesus are honored. Uh, you know, when in Revelation, in, in Matthew 20, uh, when, uh, when, uh, the mother of James and John comes and says, you know, could you please make sure that when you come into your kingdom, my son, either one sits on your right and left. And he says, look, you know, that's for whom the father is willed. He doesn't say no to that. This is whom the father's will. And uh, we, we know um, in Revelation 21, in the new city of Jerusalem, the 12 apostles of the Lamb are recognized to be part of the 12 foundations of that city. So based on that, you know, the 12 apostles are honored. So in that way, we are saying they could be 12 of the elders here. The other 12 it must be Old Testament prophets whom the Lord has chosen. I'm not saying it's conclusive, but I'm just saying taking the clues we see, that's most likely it. But what I want to point out is, it seems that at this point, these people have their crowns have their garments, they're seated on the thrones, which means that they have been honored, they have been you know, given their reward, uh, and they're seated there. Now, as of this moment, as we are talking, the bodies 
of the Old Testament saints and all the New Testament believers, including the 12 apostles, uh, have all been decayed. Nobody has been resurrected. So this, the judgment seat of Christ, where our works are tried with fire and each one is given a reward, has not yet taken place. Paul writes about this, 1 Corinthians 3, we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And 2 Corinthians 5, we will receive a reward according to the works we've done. 1 Peter 5, when the chief shepherd shall appear, then we will receive a crown of glory. So this reward is connected to the appearing of the chief shepherd, the Lord, return of the Lord, which means this reward ceremony is going to take place after the chief shepherd appears. Now, why am I saying all that? When you put all these scriptures together and then look at what you're seeing in Revelation 4, it means that Revelation 4 is a scene in heaven after the chief shepherd has appeared and these people have received the resurrected bodies and this, this uh, award ceremony or reward ceremony, you know, whatever it is, has taken place. Because Peter said, when the chief shepherd shall appear, then we will receive a crown of glory, which will not fade away. So that, therefore, the conclusion is this picture of seeing these 24 elders with their crowns is a scene of the throne room after the rapture, after the rewards have been given out. That's the conclusion. And that's the scene, things which must take place. John is saying heaven, these 24 elders, Old Testament saints, Old Testament prophets, 12 apostles, they have been given their crowns, they are seated in white, ro uh, white robes, and they are seated on the throne. They got their reward. So, Revelation 4 is a scene after the rapture of the church and after the rewards have been given in heaven. It's by deduction, all right? I hope you understood the thought process. Any questions on that? Okay, so that's what John is saying. It's in the future. And uh, yeah, there you have your question. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, so, does it mean like uh, the sub subsequent chapters are uh, in chronological order? Yes. So, that's how we will be studying the book of Revelation that everything given here, starting from chapter 4, verse 1 is chronological, with these exceptions. So what do you mean? As we read, we will see, there are some places. So, so think about this. I mean, a good way to illustrate it is, suppose somebody is telling us a story, or narrating, telling us something. So they're going chronologically. This happened, and then this will happen, and this is going to happen. They're telling us everything chronologically. And then they say, by the way, Actually, in order to understand this, first, let me take you back sometime. So that does happen, and we will mention it. And also, when they narrate something, they say, okay, let me tell you uh, uh, about this, and then at the, in the end, this is what happens to this person. So that there's a little jump in the back here. So in Revelation chapter 11, I'm giving you, we'll, we'll, we'll study this as we go along, but so to answer your question generally, Revelation chapter 4, all the way 22, is taken chronologically in the sequence in which it is given, except that Revelation 10, it's uh, 
it is a parenthetical chapter, meaning it is a interlude, meaning in Re Revelation 10, God is speaking to John and says, John, I want you to eat this book because I got to show you some more things. So that's like an interlude. So it's like, it's not something that's going to happen. It's something that happened in the vision, but it was specific to John, Revelation 10. Revelation 11, he talks about the two witnesses. And in one passage in Revelation 11, he tells us all that will happen uh, from that time for three and a half years. Okay, so Revelation 11, one is the middle of the seven years of tribulation. Two, two witnesses are there. In that passage, he tells us everything that will happen for three and a half years. So it means from middle till the end. That's one under, one one piece. Revelation 12, as he tells us what's going to happen, again, with reference to the middle, middle to the end, he takes us back in time. And he says, hey, this is what happened. Um, Satan was cast out of heaven with a third of the angels. So that's going back in time. That's how he became the old serpent, the dragon. Uh, the devil and he also has a reference to the woman the man child the woman being Israel who gave birth to the man child so that's a little piece in Revelation 12 which goes back in time but then tells us what will happen from there on so there are those passages like that but other than that everything is taken sequentially chronologically in the order it is given okay. so uh so, Pastor, so is it because uh, it is chronological that uh, you can say that uh, what is mentioned in chapter 4 is rapture? It could be rapture, mentioning about rapture when John is asked to come up? Yes, it's the beginning. So at the very start of the tribulation, it is a beginning of the tribulation. So the rapture has taken place. We're seeing them all with their rewards seated around the throne. So we are saying that has happened. So the rapture of the church has happened. Uh, they've been given the rewards. That's already taken place in heaven. Chapter 6, verse 1, we come to the earth. So chapter 4 and 5 is a picture in heaven. Chapter 6, here's what's happening here on earth. So same time, but you know, you've got to give it in chapters. So this is in heaven. This is here on earth. But it's the beginning of the seven years of tribulation. Sure, sure. Thank you, Pastor. So, uh, I I believe you would have covered this earlier in eschatology, but just to again clarify, so during those seven years of tribulation, um, what are believers doing in, in uh, what are believers doing during mm. those seven years? Yeah. So during the seven years of tribulation, there is uh, the believe the believers are in heaven. Uh, they receive their rewards. They are ushered into their mansions. Yeah, so Jesus said, I'll, in my Father's house, many mansions. I go to prepare a place where you will come again and receive you to myself. So where I am, there you will be also. So we are there. Uh, we are. Uh, uh, we will be in worship. That's something we see throughout the book of Revelation. Believers standing before the throne, worshiping. We will be welcoming the souls, the spirit and souls of those who are martyred during the tribulation. We are seeing them in heaven. Uh, we are also preparing for the marriage supper of the Lamb because that seven years ends with the marriage supper of the Lamb, Revelation 19. So these are the things we know that will be taking place during the seven years in heaven. Okay, so... Uh... So this, uh, you said the rewards would have been given already, right? So mm. does not mean that the non-believers, their judgment has taken place. It will take place only at the end of the millennial reign. Yes. So the non-believers, those who are not saved, their judgment comes way at the end in Revelation chapter 20. That is at the end of the millennium when everybody stands before the great white throne judgment revelation 20 verses verse 15 that's the end yeah okay so because of all these reasons this uh, particular chapter could point to rapture mm -hmm. yes yeah. okay thank you thank you okay welcome jafina
verse 1. After these things I looked, and behold, the door standing open in heaven. So can we compare this to John 10, 9? I am the door. If anyone enters by me, you'll be saved, we'll go in and out, and, so the doors, and say that the door was Jesus. I've heard such comparisons by some pastors. I think uh, uh, the, again here, my, my response to that would be, they're not the same door. Uh, the language is the same, right? You'll find door, for example, John 10, Jesus says, I am the door. Uh, here, John says, I saw a door open to me in heaven. But Paul Paul writes, you know, says, a great door has been opened for me, uh, but there are many enemies. He's talking about the door of the gospel. So, uh, you know, the door in all these contexts are different. In John 10, when Jesus says, I am the door, uh, like Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am the water of life. I am the good shepherd. I am the light of the world. It's a picture he's giving us to convey to us that, look, salvation is only through him. Right? So it doesn't mean every time you see a door, that's Jesus. You know, it's like, <laughs> no, it's a picture he used. I am the true wine. Doesn't mean you see a wine, okay, that's Jesus. No, it's a picture. Right? So the context, he's using a picture to communicate tell us something about himself. Here, John says, I'm a door. Again, I don't, I don't think we should interpret, start, start interpreting this as, you know, there's a door to go into heaven or there are portals to go into heaven. You know, people unnecessarily make these things up. But really, it's just a saying that, look, I've transitioned from the natural world into the spiritual. That's the door. You know, when the door is an entry point, a place you go in. But then there are a lot of people start making teachings like, you know, there are portals, gateways, entry points into spiritual realms and all those things. Yeah, okay, you know, who, who knows? But that's not taught necessarily in scripture. Here he says, I see a door open in heaven, meaning the Lord is taking him into the spiritual realm. And so that's a, for him, it's a, transition uh, into the spiritual world okay that's how we should understand it I don't think we should build a theology of portals and gateways and you know doors and then people also connect start connecting gate portals to locations oh in that location you go to Jerusalem Jerusalem there's a portal into heaven you know, people do all those weird things, and uh, I, I, I don't think those things are supported by Scripture, right? Yeah. So the answer to your question is that these are two different contexts, and they should be understood in their context. Yeah? So, verse 5, thank you for the questions. Verse 5, so John is seeing this, and then he's also seeing that from the throne of God, there is so much... Um, there's thun lightnings, thunderings, voices, meaning it is magnificent. It's, you know, maybe I, I would use the word fearful. It's so awesome. And there he sees seven lamps of fire. Seven lamps of fire. And he says, these are the seven spirits of God. Remember, we saw this picture in chapter 1. Verse, uh, verse 4, from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Same thing. Seven spirits of God. So we have to be careful not to interpret this as there are seven Holy Spirits. There was, you know, sometime back, sometime back, meaning back in the 90s, I think, when people were talking about this, say, oh, seven Holy Spirits and all, and then people had to withdraw that, oh, no, 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 that's wrong. Um, seven here should be understood as rep representing perfection, completeness. There's one Holy Spirit, but he has seven facets to him, uh, which we read in Isaiah 11, 1 and 2. He's the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. Seven facets. But the Holy Spirit is complete. And so this fire representing one person got the Holy Spirit. Okay, so don't, we don't interpret it as seven spirits. 
And then let's read verses 6 through 11, please. Chapter 4, verse 6 through 11. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures, full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf, the third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, You're worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. Amen. Amen. So as part of what John is seeing in heaven, he's seeing heavenly creatures now what are these creatures and you know why does he see that like he sees and he's recognizing similarities between what he knows of the earth you know, lion calf man eagle and i seeing that so so hey it looks to me like that you know and they all have wings six uh, um, uh, wings you know and uh, they seem to have eyes everywhere. Now, these, of course, all of this looks very, very strange. When we try to imagine something like this, you know, like a calf with eyes everywhere and wings, and a lion with eyes everywhere and wings. So uh, we don't know exactly what these creatures are. Uh, uh, so we shouldn't, you know, try to speculate too much just like okay yeah there are some living creatures that look like this according to what john saw at that time and these creatures are not to be worshipped but these creatures are engaging in the worship of god so they are there they constantly in worship of god okay so these are worshiping beings which which seem like these these beings uh, John recognizes similarities uh, with them, with the earth, but they're just involved in worship. So we don't worship the lion, the calf, or man, or eagle. But these creatures are engaging in worship of God, and along with them, the elders are worshiping. So everybody in the throne room is engaged in the worship of God, and it's so interesting that you know the the the, the, the attribute of God that's being recognized in here in worship he is holy, 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 right? The holiness of God. So we can understand that there is this overwhelming sense of the holiness of God. We are in a place of absolute holiness, and these creatures, these worshiping creatures, are constantly worshiping God. And the 24 elders join in worshiping. They fall down in the worship. Right? And worship is going on. And they're recognizing who God is. So what is worship? It's recognizing who God is, recognizing his nature, and recognizing that everything has been created for him and they exist by him. Right? They are worthy. You're worthy to receive glory, honor, and power. All things are created by you and they exist for you so this continuous worship going on in the throne room is what we understand right from these these verses let's move on to chapter five in chapter five we are now seeing something happen what we are seeing is there's a scroll and there's suddenly in heaven there's a recognition that look 
the time has come to open the scroll. I'm just giving a brief of chapter 5. We'll read it. A time has come to open the scroll. But who's going to do it? Who's worthy to do it? And there we see Jesus. Now, again, Jesus is represented by the lion and the lamb. So it doesn't mean there's a lion and there's a lamb walking. right? But John is seeing Jesus represented by this. Just as the Holy Spirit is represented by seven flames, the Lord Jesus, the eternal word, is represented by lion and lamb. So don't think, in our minds, we shouldn't be thinking there's a lion and lamb walking in the throne room. No. Uh, that's that's a representation of the Son of the Living God. So Jesus comes and he is found worthy to open the scroll. And there are attributes of Jesus, his omniscience, his omnipresence, his omnipotence, spoken of chapter 5. And then he is given the scroll and he opens the scroll. That is very significant, meaning at that point, at that moment, is the beginning of of the fulfillment of all the prophecies that are in that scroll, meaning the scroll is representing all the prophetic utterances that were given by God to the prophets. And that opening of the scroll, which includes John, right, includes this book of Revelation. So you can think in time to come, there's going to come a time in heaven when the Lord Jesus comes into the throne room and the scroll is handed to him. And he alone is, only the Father knows that time. And only Jesus is worthy to open the scroll. And Jesus is the anointed one. And he opens the scroll, signifying all these prophecies are about the time to start fulfilling these prophecies has come. That's the essence of chapter 5. The opening of the scroll means let these start being fulfilled. So the time has come. And then chapter 6, verse 1, the scene switches to earth. And these prophecies start being fulfilled. Everything that was spoken by the Old Testament prophets and by or everything given in the New Testament, including the book of Revelation, starts being fulfilled. Okay, So let's read Revelation chapter 5. We can have somebody read verses 1 through 7, and then somebody else can read verses 8 through 14. Let's see if we can do this. Revelation 5. Revelation 5, verse 1 to 7. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to lose its uh, seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not be, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has prevailed to open the scroll and to lose its seven seals. And I look and behold in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it has been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirit of God sent into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Somebody else, verses 8 to 14. Thank you. Verses 8 to 14. Now, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seats, for you were slain, and you have redeemed us to God by your blood. And out of every tribe and tongue and, and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. 
Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them I heard saying, Blessing and honor, glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the twenty-four elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. Amen. Okay. So, John is seeing the throne room and uh, like we said earlier, he sees the scroll, nobody's, he weeps, he weeps. So that's interesting. Verse 4, I wept. So in the spiritual realm, you can feel emotion. Because remember, John is in the spirit. He's gone into the spiritual realm. His spirit and soul is there, his body is here on earth. He's gone through the door, he's gone through that transition, he's in the spiritual realm. And in the spiritual realm, he's weeping. I wept. So you can have an emotion in the spiritual realm, the soul, soul part, that emotion part is there. He's weeping. Uh, and then one of the elders says, John, don't cry, don't weep. Uh, Jesus, Jesus, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, he's going to open this. He's going to open this. So Jesus comes, and now Jesus here is represented with the Lamb who has been slain. He's got seven horns representing perfect authority, seven eyes representing uh, omniscience, knowledge of everything, seven spirits are representing uh, uh, his presence, seven Holy Spirit, seven anoint seven spirits. So perfect, complete in his authority, omnipotence, complete in his knowledge, omniscience, complete in his presence, om omnipresent, sent out into the all, all the earth, seven spirits sent out into all the earth, omnipresence. So this lamp is opening the scroll. And when he has taken the scroll, there's complete worship going on. Worship. Everybody, all the worshiping creatures, the four living creatures, all the elders, and then we are seeing uh, Multitudes of people, 10,000 times, sorry, uh, angels are on their own, living creatures, a number of them was thousands. Of, so these are all living, cre um, living creatures and angels, thousands and thousands around the throne. They're worshiping the Lord with a loud voice. And uh, all, of heaven, all of heaven and earth, verse 13, are worshiping, blessing and honor and glory. So this worship going on and there are people standing before the throne who, who they say we've, we've been taken from every tribe tongue and nation all of the redeemed saints of god are standing before the throne worshiping so that's another reason we are saying this has happened the rapture has happened because now in chapter five we are seeing worship happen and we are seeing people from every tribe tongue and nation along with the four living creatures along with the 24 elders along with this innumerable company of angelic hosts along with all of them there is this great multitude of saints people in, involved in worship where did they come from so we are saying okay these are obviously people who've been raptured everybody's there old testament saints new testament the church is there they're worshiping the lord and in their presence Jesus is taking the scroll and he is going to open the scroll. That's signifying that all these prophecies should now begin to be fulfilled. So, with that, chapter 6, verse 1, we transition now to what's happening here on earth. And on earth, we start seeing these things begin to take place. Okay.
So we'll, we'll, we'll pause here. Our time is up. And we're going to pick up from chapter 6, verse 1, next week. Uh, we'll probably comment a little bit more on chapter 5 and then move on to chapter 6. Okay? Could somebody close in prayer, please? And we'll dismiss. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for your grace uh, and your mercy uh, to reveal these um, things to us, Father, Lord. Um, Lord, uh, we, we thank you, Father, for helping us even understand these, Lord. It seems, um, uh, Lord, unsurmountable, but uh, thank you, Father, for giving um, your Holy Spirit, uh, Father, uh, giving uh, the wisdom to uh, Pastor Rashish. Uh, Father Lord, so that uh, he's able to explain these things to us. Uh, we pray, Father, may we be equipped uh, with what you're teaching us, uh, Lord, um, so that, uh, Lord, these prophecies you have given us Lord, so that uh, we could be prepared, we could prepare others. Uh, Father Lord, we pray that um, you help us, Lord, uh, to uh, read and uh, understand and perceive the truths that you revealed in this, Lord, and constantly remind ourselves, Lord, that we may ha have a heart of wisdom, Lord, and that we may grow in wisdom. Um, uh, thank you for your love towards us, Lord. Uh, we, uh, we, we, um, uh, Lord, uh, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' precious name. We pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Amen. everyone. Amen. Enjoy the rest of your day. We'll connect next week. God bless. Bye. Thank you. Bye.